I know they're people of strongly held views on both sides of the issue. And I know that the responsibility of a judge uh, confronting this issue is to decide the case according to the rule of law consistent with the precedents, not to take sides in a dispute as a matter of policy, but to decide it according to the law. So as of 92, you had a reaffirmation of the central holding in Roe. That's, that decision, that application of the principles of stare decisis is, of course, itself a precedent that would be entitled to respect under those principles. On um, stare decisis, I think the first issue you look at is whether or not the de uh, decision uh, uh, at issue was wrongly decided. I I've actually never quite understood how you evaluate that. If you think that the issue is one of choice, uh, uh, that women should have a choice to terminate their pregnancy, um, th that supposes that there is a point at which they've had the fair choice. Uh, opportunity to choice. And why would 15 weeks be an inappropriate line? So a viability, it seems to me, doesn't have anything to do with choice. Um, uh, but if it really is an issue about choice, why is 15 weeks not enough time? And I have no reason or agenda to prejudge the issue or to predispose to rule one way or the other on the issue of abortion, which is a difficult issue. I'm not do I have this day an opinion, a personal opinion, on the outcome in Roe versus Wade? And my answer to you is that I do not. I understand we're talking about abortion here, but what is confusing is that we, if, if we were talking about the Second Amendment, I know exactly what we're talking about. If we're talking about the Fourth Amendment, I know what we're talking about because it's written, it's there. What specifically is the right here that we're talking about? The case of Roe versus Wade has been the law. In the case of Casey, that is the law. The questions that you're putting to me are matters of how that basic right applies, where it applies, under what circumstances. And I don't think I should go into those. And it is particularly important to show what we do in overturning a case is grounded in principle and not social pressure. The problem with the super case, of which we've heard three mentioned, the problem with the super case like this, the rare case, the watershed case, where people are really opposed on both sides, and they really fight each other, is they're going to be ready to say, no, you're just political, you're just politicians. And that's what kills us as an American institution. It was decided in 1973, so it's been on the books for a long time. It has been challenged on a number of occasions, and I think that when a decision is challenged and it is reaffirmed, that strengthens its value as stare decisis for at least two reasons. Can a decision be overruled simply because it was erroneously wrong, even if nothing has changed between the time of that decision and the time when the court is called upon to consider whether it should be overruled? Um, in Planned Parenthood versus um, Casey, the court reaffirmed the core holding of Roe versus Wade that a woman has a constitutional right to terminate her pregnancy in certain circumstances. What hasn't been at issue in the last 30 years is the line that Casey drew of viability. There has been some difference of opinion with respect to undue burden, but the right of a woman to choose, the right of, to control her own body, has been clearly set for uh, since Casey and never challenged. I do think that the continuing holding uh, uh, of Roe and uh, Doe versus Bolton is that uh, women's life and women's health have to be protected uh, with in, in abortion regulation. 
uh, usually there has to be a justification, a strong justification in a case like this beyond the fact that you think the case is wrong. And I guess what strikes me when I look at this case is that, you know, not much has changed since Roe and Casey, that people think it's right or wrong based on the things that they have always thought it was right and wrong for. But in the end, we are in the same exact place as we were then, except that we're not because there's been 50 years of water under the bridge, 50 years of decisions saying that this is part of our law. And it seems to me very important, Senator, that we abide our standards of review and we don't pick and choose the areas of law to start abandoning our standards of review. And the standard of review for clear error, for factual findings, is what I wrote about. And I don't care if the case is about abortion or widgets or anything else. Uh, hypothetically, the court were to extend the undue burden standard to regulations prior to viability. Would that be workable or would that not be workable in your view? If this court were to reject the viability line, do you see any other intelligible principle that the court could choose? And one of the important things to keep in mind about Roe v. Wade is that it has been reaffirmed many times over the past uh, 45 years, as you know. And uh, most prominently, most importantly, reaffirmed in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992. Planned Parenthood versus Casey reaffirmed Roe and did so by considering the stare decisis factors. So Casey now becomes a precedent on precedent. It's not as if it's just a run-of-the-mill case that was decided and never been reconsidered. History helps think about stare decisis as I've looked at it and uh, the history of how the courts applied stare decisis. And when you really dig into it, um, history tells a somewhat different story, I think, than is sometimes assumed. If you think about some of the most important cases, the most consequential cases in this court's history, there's a string of them where the case is overruled precedent. When you have those two interests at stake, and both are important, as you acknowledge, um, why not? Why should this court be the arbiter rather than uh, Congress, the state legislatures, state Supreme Courts, the people being able to uh, resolve this? What I will commit is that I will obey all the rules of stare decisis, that if a question comes up before me about whether Casey or any other case should be overruled, that I will follow the law of stare decisis, applying it as the court has articulated it, applying all the factors, reliance, workability, um, being undermined by later facts and law, just all the standard factors, and I promise to do that for any issue that comes up, abortion or anything else, I'll follow the law. I don't have any agenda. I have no agenda to try to overrule Casey. Um, I have an agenda to stick to the rule of law and decide cases as they come. I think a lot of the colloquy you've had with all of us has been about the benefits of stare decisis, which I don't think anyone disputes. And of course, no one can dispute because it's part of our stare decisis doctrine that it's not an inexorable command and that there are some circumstances in which overruling is possible, 